everyone, as promised in class, I was going to make a pre-recorded video of the content we didn't get a chance to cover during class time. So we did this listening practice activity, and I know at the time it might seem like a little bit inane because, you know, obviously talking and listening is something we do all the time. But we did go through some of the readings about emphatic listening and active listening and how really it's quite an exhausting task if you're really truly present in the moment, really listening to the person and not having that internal monologue happening uh, inside your mind while you're trying to listen to them. Remember, we talked about the difference between how hearing is automatic, whereas listening should be active particularly if it's something you're going to be doing for an important business engagement, whether it be recruiting a new hire or trying to learn more about a client or as part of the workshop that we did in class, the negotiations workshop, listening to try and figure out whether or not you can come to some sort of agreement that's beneficial, not only for you, but potentially for both parties. So what we did in this activity just before we ran out of time was I had you guys pair up during the break and talk to someone else that hopefully you hadn't met before within the MBA cohort um, to use some of the tips that we um, will go through in the next slide on how to get the most out of a, a, a short listening sort of conversational um, activity. Uh, I asked you guys to find out something interesting about your uh, counterpart and then to flip the roles over in about five minutes. And the key was to make, make it you know, feel natural and to learn as much as possible about the other person without making it feel like it was an interrogation. And that's quite a fine balance because obviously to learn more, you need to ask questions, but if it's question after question after question, as if you're going through a checklist, then it comes across as being a little bit of an interrogation. So, you know, I think this listening is a skill that uh, we're, sort of, we're all born with, most of us, but at the same time, it is also a skill that uh, can always be developed, just like presentation skills and communication skills. Before the activity, we talked about some tips on how to enhance your listening capabilities. We talked about how there are certain things you do internally during the listening activity or the uh, listening engagement. Uh, and then there are things you do externally. So in terms of internally, listening without an agenda was something that was really important that we discussed in class. I mentioned earlier about how sometimes if you have a list of questions, for instance, if you're embarking on market research, um, you have a list of questions and it's very tempting to just kind of be more focused about getting through that list than to actually be listening to the person. Because often, if you can keep them talking, they will answer a lot of the questions that might be coming up anyway. So when I supervise super uh, PhD students or master's students, I always you know, get them to start off with an interview guide, but the key is not to be driven by the guide, right? They're just prompts to make sure that you have covered stuff that's important. But if a person is talking and they're sharing information with you anyway, it doesn't matter if they answer question one and then incidentally answer question five. Um, you need to be listening rather than worried about whether or not you can cover the agenda. Um, listening is also very different from just letting stuff wash over you. We've discussed it. Uh, previously in class and also the two articles that I assigned about active listening and emphatic listening, um, you know, help to kind of really tease the difference apart between hearing versus listening. So listening should be active, particularly emphatic listening when you're trying to get a feel for what a person is experiencing. Another thing that came up during class discussions was to avoid giving advice. So avoid having that internal monologue where the moment you hear someone say something, um, particularly if they're sharing something that's quite distressing to them or if they're just looking for support, it's very tempting to say, oh, well, you should do this or I would have done that. Um, when really that's not the best approach because often you just want the person to keep talking so that they can get the whole story across. And this has a very therapeutic um, uh, a 
effect, but also it's fantastic for relationship building, right? And it's something that you know I myself has struggled with for many decades. And it's this um, this feeling that if someone is talking to you, then they are actually wanting advice, and so you kind of jump in uh, a little bit too soon uh, and offer advice. But really, the first thing you should do is listen to everything, um, and then give advice if they ask for it, or just keep them talking. Um, because that is that is where the real sort of relationship building and re where the learning occurs in terms of trying to figure out what's happening for the other party. Uh, and the final internal tip was this idea um, of unconditional positive regard, uh, which is a concept that Carl Rogers came up with in the 1950s, a humanistic psychologist. And this unconditional positive regard is this sense of, you know, reserving judgment, not being judgy, just listening to a person for what they're trying to share with you. Another way, a more modern uh, term for unconditional positive regard is benign curiosity. So this is a curiosity where you just want to learn what the experience has been like for the person um, and, or what they, what, you know, they want to share with you about whatever context it is that you're having the whole conversation around. Uh, and rather than coming in too quickly with your own judgments, just you know, giving the impression or genuinely um, coming across as someone that you know, isn't judging, uh, that you're just, you have this curiosity about them and their lived experience. Um, and, and that sort of internal sort of approach to listening will help the other person feel like it's all right to, to keep going. So in terms of externally, what you're doing that the person can actually see during the listening activity is to be present. And we talk about, you know, how paraphrasing sometimes help. So saying things like, you know, what I'm hearing you say is, or it sounds like this, or, oh, it was interesting when you mentioned that. Um, just to make sure that they know that you are actually listening to them rather than just hearing them. Body language is very important. So obviously leaning in, mimicking their, their sitting position or their standing position, nodding, all those little sort of micro cues, right? Um, a lot of communication is uh, visual as in body language. And so, you know, um, appearing interested and assuming a posture of intent, present sort of interest in the other person will help them continue the conversation. We all know that now that multitasking is a myth. You can't be checking your phone while you're apparently listening intently uh, or emphatically to someone else. So you want to avoid distraction, even make it really obvious. And I did this in our first class where I said, look, my phone is going face down uh, because I am totally devoted to what's happening right now in front of me. Use open-ended questions, so that's a given, and most of you uh, being in the MBA would have um, worked in areas uh, where you're already familiar uh, of the value of open-ended questions in terms of gathering information. There is an occasion for closed-ended questions when perhaps the situation is a little bit more competitive um, or combative, um, or you don't want a person to sort of throw up a smoke screen but on average, if, you're, if you've decided that it's important to have a conversation with someone and you're practicing active or emphatic listening, then open-ended uh, questions are obviously a better way to go. And finally, silence is your friend. All too often, and this is something that I've also struggled with uh, for many decades, is filling the silence, right? Because uh, it gets awkward. And you know, the one thing that um, they, they train counselors and therapists and psychologists is to sit with the silence. And obviously those people I've just mentioned are the best listeners in the world. And just having that silence there, if you're doing market research or if you're dealing with a difficult client or a customer service recovery sort of situation, um, don't be afraid of just letting things go quiet for a lot longer than what you're comfortable with. Because often people are processing, particularly if it's an emotionally charged situation. And so having that silence as your friend will let them keep talking rather than you trying to fill that awkward silence with your own advice or, or some other sort of unrelated topic. So obviously what you practice externally then feeds into that conversation and it you know, continues uh, to perpetuate in a positive cycle. Uh, if you do continue to do things internally that make you a better listener and the cycle continues. So after we did that uh, de um, the activity, we didn't really have much um, chance to debrief. I asked a few um, of the students in the class, 
what they found challenging, why that might be the case, but more importantly, I focused on what, uh, well, who found the listening task easy and what their tricks were. Now we didn't have, we were running out of time at that point because we had the fantastic um, negotiations workshop about to occur. Um, I remember one of the students saying that, look, they work in recruitment and basically listening to people is, is their bread and butter because they're trying to figure out what a person's um, experiences are, what their strengths are in order to place them in the best possible um, you know, job opportunity uh, in terms of being a recruitment agent. Um, one trick I really liked in that debrief was that, you know, setting the tone of what the conversation will be like will help a person talk more and therefore make your job of listening easier. So sometimes if a person is going into a conversation with a, who is a, essentially a stranger, they might not know how much to share or what the situation is. Is this a competitive sort of conversation or is this an actual genuine relationship building conversation? So just being upfront and, and, and letting them know if it is indeed a situation where the conversation is to learn more about the other person, then that will make them more likely to open up, which in turn makes it easier for you to sit back and listen, or we'll actually lean in and listen. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't start off with sort of the rules of the game, then some people might think that they shouldn't be saying too much because they're not sure what the, the conversational situation is. So listening is a really important ingredient for success. It's so fundamental to many, many different aspects of life and business. For example, in negotiations, one of the things that you would have discovered during that negotiations activity was that there was information asymmetry. And one way of mitigating that asymmetry is to listen. The more you listen to the other counterpart, the more you find out about them and the more likely you will discover their true motivations rather than their position. And in figuring out what their motivations are, you can approach a negotiation situation as a problem to solve jointly. So you take a joint problem solver approach rather than a positional approach of I want this and I think they want that. So I'm going to I'm going to be very competitive, you know, rather if you listen to the person, they might find out that there's actually a larger zone of proximal agreement than what was initially presented. In terms of conflict resolution, listening is super important. You know, when there is a conflict there, usually means that there's emotion involved and people say that emotion is energy in motion. So it needs to go somewhere. You can't really just bottle it up and hope it goes away. The emotion needs to be released somehow and listening is the perfect way to neutralize that. You let the person talk and talk and talk until they let that energy out and then they're in a position where whatever resolution to the conflict is presented will be much more palatable. You can't come straight in with your advice in an emotionally charged situation because people undergo what's called an amygdala hijack and therefore they're not in a state of uh, rational sort of thinking, right? And so by listening to someone, you enable them to take the emotion out of the situation and they're in a position where they're more likely to, to be able to in turn listen to you. So you listen to them first, then they can listen to you. The other thing with conflict resolution is that because most people are really uncomfortable in conflict, they want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. So that means they'll schedule a one hour meeting and hope to God that it'll be finished in an hour and they never have to worry about it again because they're losing sleep or it's just something that they're not comfortable with. What you'll find is that if you listen and you listen as long as it takes for the emotion to discharge, you might run out of time, but that's actually okay because then you reschedule and you reschedule and you reschedule. You keep listening for as long as a person has something to say. That extends the time, which as a matter of fact is better for the conflict resolution situation because it takes the emotion out and then it allows a proposal or some sort of solution to present itself. You know, and so by listening, yes, it will take more time. And that's why maybe people don't like doing it, but actually time in a conflict resolution situation is often more helpful than not. In terms of coaching, those of you doing our leadership coaching course, um, you'll find that trust is really important and rapport is really important in a coaching relationship. How do you build those two things? How do you amplify trust and rapport? Listening, once again. 
by listening to the, the, the client or the other person that's being coached, um, you'll find out what their career ambitions are, what they're having trouble with, what they would like to learn more, what they need advice on perhaps. So all of those things are only possible through listening. In terms of leadership, you know, some people think the leader is a person that tells people what to do. Uh, they're up in front with a megaphone, basically shouting out orders. You know, that might have been the old style of leadership, you know, back sort of before World War II. But, you know, the modern leader is a servant leader. And in order to serve your staff better, you need to know what's important to them. In order to know what's important to them, you must listen. And once you listen to what their needs are, it'll make your communication more successful because you'll be able to talk from the audience's perspective. You know, so for those of you that have done our communications um, and media training, um, you know, the emphasis, the focus should always be on the audience. And how do you find out more about the audience? It's by listening to them, right? That's why our instructor said, you know, start with a question. Uh, and if you get a response, that's actually great because then your ability to listen will help guide the rest of the presentation uh, and it'll give you a sort of communications mandate. In terms of management, you know, listening well boosts productivity and is a fantastic troubleshooter. So, you know, an example of that trouble might be conflict uh, as discussed previously. So by listening, you can help solve problems, uh, neutralize emotions and, and manage um, situations and people better. In terms of a productivity booster, you know, if your job as a manager is to help enable your staff to do their, their job the best way they can, then you need to know what they need. And the only way to know what they need um, is to listen to them. Similarly, if they have problems, the only way to know more about what their problems are so that you may help them solve those problems is once again by listening. And you want to listen fully rather than listening a little bit and then coming in with your advice because you're the manager. Um, you need to let them talk all the way through um, to the point of, you know, maybe even you, you, you think it's taking too long, it's getting a bit tedious, but you have to give them that opportunity to share. Otherwise, they're going to feel like you're not really listening uh, and you're just coming in with some advice that is more beneficial for the organization. In terms of marketing, Obviously, listening is a huge part of market research, understanding more about consumers, understanding what they think about your competitors, uh, understanding how you can better enhance your own products and services. But simply through the act of listening uh, emphatically, you will improve your company's reputation. Um, and that in turn will help you build a relationship with your customers. If you think about two companies offering exactly the same product at the same price that do the same thing, I can guarantee you the company that listens more to the customers will end up with a competitive advantage. So some other things to consider. First is to be aware of the three types of listening. When you're listening, there's actually three broad objectives. One is listening to win. And so this might be really important in a legal perspective or in competitive negotiations. Um, so in those situations, when you're listening, you're finding out the weak points in another person's argument, or you're finding about, out about some motivation that they may not have made too obvious uh, in their position. By learning those things, it puts you in a stronger position in order to you know, win your negotiation or your side of, of the battle. Right? So that's listening to win. The, the, the key to not um, screwing up the listening, even when you're listening to win, is to not have too much of that internal monologue happening once again. So even in a situation like a debate where you're listening to win, you might hear them say something and in your mind immediately you're like, ha, I've got you. Now, instead of thinking about how you've got them and what you're going to say that's so clever that's going to really throw them, keep listening, right? So you can jot down the note, but don't get too fixated to that. Don't go back into your internal monologue. Keep listening because there might be more tidbits to that that will help flesh out their story that will enable you to win even better. The second type of listening is listening to fix. And so this is a classic one. And I mentioned this earlier about how it's very difficult not to have the internal monologue of, oh, I would have done this or you should have done that. Or if I were you, you should do this. Right. So giving advice, listening to fix. When you do that, you end up not allowing the person to share their experiences fully and you might miss out some other key components. So it's fine to listen to fix, but once again, even though you've come up with a solution internally, 
you just want to maybe quickly jot it down but continue listening to that person now the type of listening that we talk about in emphatic listening and active listening is listening to learn and this was that benign curiosity that i mentioned earlier so in listening to learn which is the best type of listening in terms of gathering the largest amount of information possible is that you're listening because simply you're curious they talk about taking a childlike approach to it so imagine you've never seen this thing before you've never talked to this person or you've never experienced what they've experienced so then the questions you ask will be of genuine curiosity or benign curiosity that it's that unconditional positive regard for the topic matter or the person this enables them to keep sharing so that you can actually learn more about them their experience the situation than if you were listening to win or to fix or with that internal monologue so listening to someone is a surefire way of acknowledging three really fundamental parts of any human being one is their sense of significance or sometimes this could be referred to as their sense of autonomy and this is basically that they have free will and they can or should be able to do what they feel like doing and by listening to them it makes them feel like you know they matter um, that they're significant the other thing is competence people have a need to be competent competent at things listening to someone allowing them to share their experience how they did something before you come in with oh i would have done it this way or you should have done it that way you know by listening to the way they approach things that enables them to feel a sense of competence when talking with you and finally people need to feel liked or that they're likable or that they can relate to other people within their social circles within society within their tribe by listening you're genuinely showing that you relate to them that you understand where they're coming from so those three things significance competence and likability are fundamental um, for people to feel good about who they are um, when you give advice when you are trying to resolve conflict when you try to provide feedback you have to be very careful that you do not insult a person's significance their competence or their likability because when you do that people get on the defensive so i've actually got another video about how to provide feedback in teams now listening is a big part of acknowledging those three things that a person is significant in other words they have their own, own autonomy that their competence and they have some sort of skill that you can learn from them or at least that they would like to feel like they can share and finally that they can relate to you or they are likable in general by listening it really helps the person experience all three of those things which will then make your feedback much easier to give or your advice more palatable, pal palatable to them um, or the conflict situation much less charged even when you're doing all of this and you're listening the other really important thing to consider is that acknowledging what someone is saying is not the same as agreeing or accepting responsibility for something right and so we know that in some situations people are very reluctant to apologize uh, to say i'm sorry or that the company is sorry or the company regrets because then it gives the indication that people who are listening to win on the other side might take that as, a, as an opportunity to, to, to get one over on you. So what I'm saying is that you can listen for hours and hours and hours without ever accepting responsibility because all you're doing is that you're acknowledging their side of the story in terms of the way they experience things. That's very different from saying, I agree. So you can let a person share what they wanna share, how they saw things, and then there will be a point where you can share how you saw things or what was happening for you during the same sort of interaction or the same um, experience that you're talking about. I'm just saying that with listening, by acknowledging it, you're fulfilling their sense of significance, competence, and likability, and therefore they will then be more receptive of what your experience is. At no point do you have to say while you're listening I agree completely with what you're saying and that it's all my fault or, or whatever or that the company should do this because you've said these things no 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 you're just allowing that emotion to ride through learning as much as possible about their experience and 
by learning more about them, you can come to some sort of solution that will be hopefully beneficial for all parties. Um, and at the very least, if you can, they owe it to you after you've listened to them for whatever length of time they wanted, that they now have to reciprocate. And so then you get a chance to get your side of the story across. Right, the next couple of slides we're going to cover were those that I wanted to cover in class after the negotiations activity, but we ran out of time. And it's all about buy-in. So one challenge to strategic management is buy-in. And in the first two sessions, we looked at communication and listening skills. And we also threw in there the negotiations workshop. Now, why did we combine those three things at this early part of the course? The reason we combine those three base skills is that they are the capabilities you require to get buy-in because buy-in is a massively important part of strategic management. So there'll be other courses as well within the MBA that teach you how to manage people, such as those based on human resources and organizational behavior. But at the very fundamental base level, you'll need to be able to A, communicate what you need to happen, and B, listen to other people to figure out where their goals and the values are so you can find that alignment and C, negotiate because most parts of strategy will involve some form of buy-in, which in turn requires some form of negotiation. Even your direct reports, so those people you have some sort of legitimate authority over, will still need to be negotiated with in order to get their buy-in. Because if you don't negotiate and you just straight up direct them to do something, they may only do the, very, the, the minimum of what you're asking them to do, or even worse, if they don't like the way you've communicated with them because you haven't listened to them and you haven't bothered to negotiate with them, they may even do things uh, in a way that actually disrupt the plan of what you're trying to do. So buy-in is something that we will touch on at the very end of this course, but I thought now would be a good time to bring it in since we've just finished the workshop on negotiations. Everyone else is also a negotiation, particularly those that are not your direct reports. So we've already mentioned how you know important it is to communicate, listen, and negotiate with direct reports. But you can imagine that people when you don't have a di direct reporting line from will, you know, basically they don't owe you anything. And so in order to get them to do something that you need them to do, then the three skills of communication, listening, and negotiation becomes even more critical. In staying with negotiations as a form of getting buy-in, this is a matrix I really like to use. On the horizontal axis, we see reason on one end and empathy on the far other end. In terms of the vertical axis, we see data at the top and intuition down the bottom. Now, in the top left-hand corner, we have a way of approaching negotiations as logic. By that, we mean we use data, which we know to be true, what we're very certain of, and reason in terms of rational thinking and a rational approach. If we move to the right, we leave the reason and move towards more of an emph emphatic sort of approach to negotiations. But it's still the top right hand corner. So that means we're still basing our decisions on data that we can see or what we think to be true. If we move down we now leave the data behind and we're starting to go with more intuition. And so in the bottom right hand corner, we talk about trying to use our empathy, our emphatic listening, our active listening, those mirror neurons to try and get a feel for what people's inferences are in order to try to figure out what their thoughts and feelings might be, which then leads us to their motivations. So then we swing back across to the bottom left hand corner where reason re-enters the equation and now we're applying that rational thought but with the intuition of what we know about the person's motivations and therefore we approach a motivational problem-solving approach to the negotiations now different people will be different uh, will have different abilities in those four quadrants and different preferences but ideally part of um, getting to be a better negotiator in order to get better buy-in and to solve problems better is to be aware, first of all, that there are these four different quadrants. Uh, and secondly, more importantly, training yourself to be able to sort of move between those different ways of approaching negotiations, depending on the people you're negotiating with and the situation. And the, typically, you can also use all four in a sort of a chain of events, starting first 
with the top left hand corner, which is just the bare facts of what you know to be true, what's presented at that point, and thinking through those rationally. So as you know, I'm a huge superhero nerd, and so I've gone and put um, some of my favorite superheroes into this matrix. So the first one in that top left-hand corner of logic would, of course, be vision, right? Using data and being very rational. Now, moving across, away from the reason, um, reasoning and going towards empathy, however, still being very heightened and in tune with the facts that you can see, I think Captain America moves into that top right-hand corner. Now, then we talk about moving down towards that intuitive, empathetic, really good at reading people. I think Black Widow is probably the hero that best personifies that approach. And then moving across to motivational problem solving, if you want to take a moment to guess who, might, who that might be, that's right, it's Iron Man. And so what we have is, if you are all four, you can have sort of an Avengers approach to your negotiations skills. Another way of looking at that matrix is to move from the outside in. And so when we start with what we can see and what we hear, this is very much that outside, that data-driven approach, right? Um, and whether that be you approach the data from a very rational, reason-based angle, or just by being very empathetic and having that heightened sense of awareness, you can see what people are saying and doing. It's the positions that they're presenting. It's the contract on the table. It's what they're asking for in the tender, right? So we start off on the outside with what we know to be true. That's the data. And then we move in using the empathy to try and figure out what they're actually thinking or feeling. You know, so this is moving into that sort of intuitive empathetic zone. And then at the very bottom left-hand corner of that quadrant, if you recall, it was Using the motivations, because you have used your intuition and empathy and active listening and all those other skills to figure out what their motivations are. Because once you do, you can figure out what's driving their behavior using the emotions that they may have conveyed that you've picked up or other aspects of the conversation that they've revealed during that emphatic intuitive phase. And once you get to that middle, we can move into that problem solving um, approach. Another way to wrap it all together is this diagram that I drew up which compares the processes that we've just seen to the concepts covered in many negotiation um, workshops and lectures. So on the right you'll see there is this zone of proximal agreement. So in my view this is where the values align what somebody wants and what another person also is willing to give up, there is that overlap, if you recall. Um, if we can understand a person's motivations in terms of why they're doing something, then we can also understand how we can help them enact those motives without necessarily compromising on our own position. And so that's why I'm a real fan of that uh, previous matrix that we covered, because it shows that by using data, by using listening, by being empathetic and also intuitive, and then figuring out how to solve a problem, you can expand that value alignment. Now, anything that still doesn't fit within that value alignment falls to the wayside in terms of the BATNA, or the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, right? But I guess the point of taking you through those four different quadrants is that by using those four different things that draw on the combination of reason and empathy and data and intuition, you're hopefully trying to get a better feel as well as a better understanding of that person, both from what they present initially, what you can see, what you can hear them do, um, what you can, what they you know, offer you, all the way through to just getting a feel and really understanding and allowing them to share whatever it is that is on their mind, um, even though they may not have initially decided to share that information with you. And hence, this links back to the earlier stuff on listening capabilities. So, in summary, as a superpower, listening is the most accurate way of reading someone's mind. It's a critical starting point for building capabilities for performance. While hearing is automatic, listening is active, and it is actually much harder to do properly than what we take for granted. Like any other capability though, however, it can be developed and enhanced. It can be used to solve numerous issues, one of which is helping you to become a better negotiator, 
but also in the previous slide we looked at all the other ways that listening can help enhance your performance in many aspects of business and life.